Okay guys, I'm turning this way because I'm facing the summit. Here we are in the rocket yard. I was at lunch with the astronaut. He'll excuse me, I'm a bit sluggish now because that was an all-you-can-eat buffet and I am stuffed. I filled myself up on salad, which is always a mistake. that we present the story of NASA's Apollo program, the greatest adventure mankind has ever undertaken. When I was a kid, I used to dream about falling <coughs> through space. Every week on TV, I'd watch my heroes get jumped into their rocket ships and took to the stars. And I wanted to be like them. They had courage, imagination, and no problem ever stood in their way for long. You know, in the end, when we actually did send men into space, it turned out that those were exactly the qualities it took. I'm John Hudson. This is Pad 39 of the Kennedy Space Center. I was a launch controller here when from this very spot, man took off to fly to the moon. It was a journey that began 12 years before that rocket ever left the ground. And it started on the other side of the world. Back then, we were one of two superpowers that always seemed to be on the edge of a terrible war. In 1957, the Soviet Union launched the first ever man-made satellite into Earth orbit. They called it Sputnik, which means traveling companion. And in a world where peace hung in a delicate balance, it seemed to create a dangerous advantage. Every ham radio operator in America could hear it beacon. People were afraid. Were the Soviets looking down on us? Watching us? If they could make a satellite pass over our cities, could they do the same with a bomb? Our own space program kicked into high gear. And less than two months later, we were ready to launch our own satellite. and they were eager and ready to take the big ride. But our manned space program couldn't seem to get off the ground. We stuck with it, and on May 5th, 1961, things finally started going right. Astronaut Alan Shepard took his ship Freedom 7 six and a half miles into space. America had its first space hero. Just a few days later, our space program received a new challenge. But this one did not come from the Soviet Union. It came from our young president. In one inspiring moment, he changed the mission. From one based in fear of the present to one of hope for the future. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this detain and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. We hadn't been more than 16 minutes into space, and now we were going to the moon. We would have to design a rocket the size of a 36-story office building, put it together with the precision of a microscope, and accelerate it to the speed of a bullet. Then, we would have to guide it to a moving target 250,000 miles away. Many people thought it was an impossible dream, but 400,000 of us 
set about making that dream a reality. It would be the longest, the most hazardous voyage that any man had dared to attempt. But step by step, mission by mission, we orbited the Earth, perfecting the skills and technologies we would need on this incredible journey. Our astronauts practiced maneuvering, docking, and the thousand other tasks that would comprise the moon mission. We created new alloys, lighter and stronger than anything seen before. We designed communication systems that would be reliable over the vast distances. And behind it all, we tried to perfect the rocket that would be powerful enough to punch out of Earth orbit and take us to the moon. One day, however, the dream of flying to the moon almost slipped away. It was January 27, 1967. Astronauts Virgil Gus Grissom, Edward White, and Roger Chaffee were on board Apollo 1 for a plugs out test, a full scale dress rehearsal for the actual launch. Suddenly it happened. There was a fire in the gaps. Three men whose lives had been in our hands were lost. Surely the opening vistas of space promise high cost and hardships as well as high reward. But this country of the United States was not built by those who waited and rested and wished to look behind them. After Apollo 1, some thought we'd failed and that the moon was out of our reach. But we owed it to those men to learn from their sacrifice and to carry on. We started taking the Apollo vehicle apart, piece by piece. Was the design flawed? Had safety been compromised? Tough questions. And we spent one and a half years redesigning the spacecraft so that no astronaut's life would ever be at risk because we overlooked something or because we could have done something better. A moon rocket is 91% high explosive and it goes into the most unforgiving hazardous environment there is. We could never make it risk-free, and the men who flew them knew that. We didn't send men into space again until Apollo 7 orbited the Earth testing some of the new design. When everything worked perfectly, the decision was made. The next mission would travel to the moon. It was mankind's destiny to leave the shores of our planet behind and strike out across the vast ocean of space. In the great span of our history, now was the time that we could. Now was the time that we would. We stood on the eve of the longest, most dangerous journey that any man had ever undertaken. And it would be taken by Frank Borman, James Lovell, and William Andrews, the crew of Apollo 8. Through those doors, you'll find the firing room, launch control, just as it was on December 21st, 1968. This is the firing room, launch control for the Apollo missions. This is not a mock-up. These are the very consoles we sat at when men first took off to fly to the moon. The tragedy of Apollo 1 had put us a year and a half behind. We were making up for it in one big leap, and we were doing it with a rocket that no man had ever flown before. It was a few days before Christmas, 1968, when Apollo 8 sat on the pen. She was the first of a new kind, a moon rocket. This was the Phoenix, risen from the ashes of Apollo 1. The first Apollo crew did not die in vain. This was to be their testament. <coughs> 36 stories high, she had been fully fueled throughout the night. The liquid oxygen in her tanks caused ice to form on the outside of the cracker. The extreme temperature differences between the air and the sub-zero fuel 
cause the metal skin of the rocket to expand and contract. Everyone was on the pan agreed. It was as though the rocket was alive, breathing, straining at the leash. Earlier in the morning, astronauts Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders had made their final preparations before taking that long ride out to the waiting spacecraft. The minimum safe distance from a Saturn V at liftoff was three miles. The reason was simple. When fully fueled, the rocket contained the explosive power of an atomic bomb. As the clock counted down, the astronauts and all of us in launch control went through the pre-flight checks, our hands on the controls of the most powerful, most complex machine ever built. It had over two million separate systems, and to bring these men back alive, everything had to work perfectly. Each individual system had been tested, but what we didn't know was how they would perform when all two million began to work together. That moment would come when the countdown clock reached zero. If a maneuvering thruster failed, if communications broke down, if navigation was off by one degree, if any piece of the miles of wiring, circuits, relays, or valves was defective, Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders would pay with their lives. As they sat waiting for launch on that chill December morning, these three astronauts were back to what they had always been, test pilots. You are now in the final minutes before the launch of Apollo 8, right here where it actually happened. Mankind is about to leave his planet behind and journey to another. It is one of those rare moments when history is not being made, destiny is being embraced.
third stage. Propellants pressurized at this time as we come up on the 60 second mark by the flight to the moon. very well on the camera but Can this is huge you watch Michelle go she's actually jogging over to it you get a little bit of perspective there uh, that's a guess I would say them exhausts on that them rocket motors are about 12 feet in diameter each so you've got 24 36 probably 40 foot of diameter 50 foot of diameter, it's huge and it goes on for miles. Well, obviously, not literally miles, but 300 and something feet, is it? And we'll take a stroll down it in a second and we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more. Yeah, 
The reason we've come to NASA is because, kind of for me, yeah, because I'm really geeky and into all this sort of stuff. And I watch all the films, also. we watched Apollo 13 before we came over. Uh, we're now going to have to go and watch an Apollo 11 one, I think. Okay, I don't know where it ends. Yeah, well, we do. It's history. <laughs> <laughs> We'll go back and watch the right stuff. Yeah. Well, what's that, haven't I? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, we'll go and take a little bit further down. Maybe we don't.